Well, we're in week two of a four-part series on what it means to be the church. Uh, the events of recent months have raised a lot of challenging questions of what, of what, about what it means to be the church, about what it looks like to, to live and to speak and to worship faithfully as the people of God, one heart, one mind, one voice. So it's a good time, I think, to listen afresh to scripture on these important matters. We began last week with Ephesians chapter 4, where we talked about the church as one body. And now this week, we go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. And by the way, if you're confused why I say 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians instead of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, it's because I lived in Canada and the UK for the last 10 years, and I got used to doing it that way. So please forgive me, <laughs> um, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best to make corrections as I go. Um, but as we look at 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, we're looking at the church as a Eucharistic fellowship. Now, one of the important things to understand is that in Paul's mind, last week's one body and this week's Eucharistic fellowship are intimately bound together. Because for Paul, the Eucharist is very much about the unity of the church, the one people of God. Paul says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, because there is one body, Eucharist, we who are many are, or because there is one bread, Eucharist, excuse me, we who are many are one body, church. For, because we all partake of one bread, Eucharist. So Paul does this one bread, one body, one bread. The two are intimately bound together. Now, I must say that it was a little bit painful this last week reflecting on the Eucharist <laughs> and preparing for this, because honestly, I really miss it. it it's, it's one of the things I long for so deeply is, is to be around the table with you all again. It's been about three months. And I've had conversations with many of you from day one all the way to now about how many of you are hungering for this Eucharistic celebration together. And, and I'm really hoping that we can do it again soon sometime. Uh, I've been in conversation with clergy, actually, about what this could possibly look like and brainstorming different options and, and how can we do this wisely and safely. Um, but I think even in the midst of fasting from the Eucharist, maybe it provides us with an interesting opportunity to reflect upon it. One of the things that I think Paul wants us to see in this passage is that the Eucharist is about much more than just meeting personal spiritual needs, although that's really important. The Eucharist is about more than that. The Eucharist is about interpersonal, communal relationships as well. In other words, the Eucharist, I think we'll see in this passage, invites us to adopt an others-oriented ethic that is self-sacrificial, cruciform, for the sake of the whole body of Christ, for the good of the whole community. Now, I want to say, I want to say quickly at the beginning here that I was in conversation with Lisa Igram this last week because she's doing her PhD on 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <laughs> and um, a lot of her thoughts will be strewn throughout this sermon because she really helped me wrestle with this dynamic, especially this others-oriented ethic that Paul thinks is so connected to what it means to celebrate the Lord's table together. Paul um, even goes so far as to say in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 11, that if we are not living this other-oriented way, this cruciform way in relation to one another, then gathering together to celebrate the Eucharist can actually do more harm to our communal life than good. It can actually manage to be detrimental to us rather than edifying and nourishing. And Paul unpacks this in the verses that follow. In verses 18, he says, there are divisions among you. Verse 19, there are factions among you when you come together. And he explains this further in verse 21. He says, for when you come together and eat to eat, while you are sharing a meal, each one of you goes ahead with his own meal. Notice the individualism Paul is highlighting here. Each one does what is right in his own eyes. Each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and the other gets drunk. Now, a little bit of context may be helpful here. 
in the ancient world, there were many different types of, of meals and they were kind of for, quite formally defined. And, and each type of meal came with a different set of social expectations that required a different set of social behaviors. And, and while we don't know for sure, it seems, it seems quite likely that the early church gathered on a frequent basis to celebrate a, what was often known as a private dinner. Now, in the ancient world, at a private dinner, each person that was attend the dinner was responsible for bringing their own food that they were going to eat themselves at that dinner. So it's kind of like an in-house picnic or something like that. Um, now, Christians messed with this pretty quickly because they viewed themselves as one family. So if you bring food, then you share with those that don't have food. But it was really easy in this private dinner context for the church to easily reflect the kind of socioeconomic stratification of its surrounding culture. So on the one hand, you could end up with these meals where the wealthy are there feasting on generous amounts of delicious and delectable food while you have the poor in the midst that have little to nothing to eat. And as best as we can tell, it seems that Paul is addressing a situation where this is happening among some of the Christian gatherings. And an added layer to this is that when Christians came together for these private meals, they often celebrated a Eucharistic meal in attachment to it. And this is where the problem seems to arise for Paul. <laughs> in the church, Paul says, we all partake of one and the same bread and one and the same cup. In other words, as Christians, we do not enjoy a feast while our brothers and sisters go without. And yet that seems to be precisely what is happening at these private dinners. So Paul says, each one of you, goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, the other gets drunk. So it seems that Paul is saying the wealthy Christians are used to having their luxuries and their conveniences and their freedoms and their privileges. And they're not about to give those up at a Christian gathering just because the poor don't have the same privileges. So they enjoy what they like to enjoy while others go without. And Paul says this should not be the case among you. Paul's actually indignant. Like his language, you can't, it's hard pressed to find other places in his letters where he is more indignant than here. Look at verse 22, how strongly worded it is. What? Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise? I mean, that's strong language. The church of God and humiliate those who have nothing amongst you. What shall I say? Shall I commend you in this? No, absolutely not. I will not. Very strongly worded, worded kind of admin, I mean, correction to, to the church. And, and I think one of the things that's so surprising here is notice how Paul is not pinpointing their personal piety or their lack of personal piety, although he could easily do that. They're getting drunk. What Paul is really concerned about here is something that we may call like social piety. He's really concerned about how the actions of particular Christians in the church are affecting the whole church and the whole body. And that's why this unequal feasting is such a big problem to Paul. Because Paul is convinced that Christians are called to live and to act and to make decisions and to speak as one body. It's as if Paul is saying, we miss the whole point of the Eucharist, the whole heartbeat of the Lord's Supper, if we think only in terms of our own needs and not also in terms of the needs of others. And Paul goes on to unpack this even further in chapter 12, where he says God's vision for the church is very different than this. He says in verse 4, 24 in chapter 12, God has so made the church, so composed the church, that he has given greater honor to the part that lacked it, to the weaker part, to the poorer part. He has given greater honor so that there may be unity, no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. 
If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So what do we see Paul unpacking here in chapters 11 and 12? I think Paul is trying to encourage us strongly into an others-oriented ethic. Ethical choices are made not just for the sake of like, what's the right choice for me in this situation, even if my conscience is like totally free to make that choice, but rather what choice will build up the whole body of Christ in unity and mutual care the most. This, I think, according to Paul, is the heartbeat of the Eucharist itself. Because I think he is saying to us, I'm asking you to relate to one another in the same way that Christ relates to you in the Eucharist. And so that's why in verses 23 through 25, he brings up the words of the Lord himself. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And this is what he said. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. See, I think the point here is not that the Corinthians have forgotten what Jesus said, so they need to be reminded of it in some way, shape, or form. But I think Paul is trying to make a very particular point. Jesus has acted in exactly the opposite way that you guys are acting in relation to one another. Uh, New Testament scholar Bruce Winter, in his book, After Paul Left Corinth, which I personally have found like really helpful for ending kind of the socioeconomic dynamics that Paul's speaking to in Corinth. He observes, I think very powerfully, how Paul changes the original word order of Jesus' words of institution as we have them in the Gospels. And he does this to drive home a point. Paul takes the personal pronoun, the Greek personal pronoun, mu, which is just my, which Jesus put at the end of the sentence in the Gospels, and he moves it to the beginning of the sentence here in the way that he retells it. And in Greek, when you move something to the beginning of sentence, that is a way of emphasizing it. So why does he move the word my to the beginning? Because I think Paul is emphasizing that it is my body that Jesus gave. It is my blood that he shed. In other words, Jesus' actions are totally self-giving. Jesus gives himself sacrificially for the good of others. And this is totally in contrast to the self-centered action that Paul sees in the Corinthian church. So Bruce, Bruce Winter says this. He says, quote, When Paul declared that these Christians were not actually observing the Lord's Supper in verse 20, he did not mean in liturgical terminology that it was sacramentally defective but rather that the way that they were acting towards each other invalidated the Lord's Supper because they acted towards the needs of others in exactly the opposite way that Jesus did. End quote. In other words, I think Paul's saying there's a deep irony here. The Corinthian Christians are acting selfishly while sharing a meal where Jesus acts sacrificially. And Paul says, no, it's not to be that way among you. It's not to be that way among you. So, how should it be? How should we relate to each other? What does it look like to live in sync with the Eucharistic fellowship that we share? in the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And, and Paul goes on to give two pastoral recommendations, or I'd say two pastoral admonitions that I think have particular relevance for us in our circumstances. The first one comes in verse 27. He says, examine yourself. Examine oneself. Examine yourself, verse 27, to make sure, verse 28, that you are not partaking of the Eucharistic feast, 
in an unworthy manner. We'll talk about this in a second. But verse 29, when you partake of it, you are discerning the body. Now, I think key for understanding what Paul means by partaking of the Eucharist in an unworthy manner is understanding what he means by the phrase discerning the body. Like, what is the body that Paul is talking about in this context? Is it Christ's body or is it the church's body? Is it the body that hung on Calvary or is it the body that you and I are a part of and, and seeking to live and love in the midst of this season? And I think for Paul, it's the latter. It's the church body. I mean, there's a couple of things that push me in this direction. One is that Paul in these verses speaks in four couplets. He says, eats the bread, drinks the cup. Body, blood. Eats the bread, drinks the cup. Eats, drinks. It's, it's referring to those sacramental elements of the cup and the bread to represent Christ's body and blood. But then when he says discerning the body, he goes from a couplet to just a single body, the body. Which makes us think that maybe here he is speaking of the one body that he referenced in chapter 10, the one body that exists because it partakes of the one body. And this would make perfect sense in light of the fact that in chapter 12, Paul goes on to unpack the relational dynamics of the church as one body. We are members of one body, says Paul, empowered by the Holy Spirit, with gifts that the whole community needs to thrive. And so Paul is saying to us here, I think he's encouraging us in the midst of our present circumstances, even in the midst of not being able to share the Eucharist together. He's saying, examine yourself. You may not be celebrating the Eucharist now, but examine how you are living in light of the unity and the oneness of the church, with the, which the Eucharist itself celebrates and embodies and nurtures. And remember this. I think Paul is saying to us, in the church, living in unity, in Eucharistic fellowship, means caring for the poorest and the weakest and the most vulnerable members of your community. So what's the upshot? We may not be faced with questions about what food to bring to a private dinner party right now. Maybe we are, maybe we're not. But we are faced with questions as a community, very real questions about reopening. When should we start physical gatherings again? What health practices should we follow when we do so? What will those meetings look like? Should we sing? Should we celebrate the Eucharist? I mean, there's, is that not wise? I mean, there's just a myriad of questions that we have. But I think what Paul is encouraging us to see is that we are a Eucharistic fellowship. And that means approaching these questions from an others-oriented posture that seeks the good of the whole community. So how will we make decisions as a church? I think what Paul would say is do what is good for the whole community and do what promotes unity. And I think he would say to us also, and keep in mind, especially those who are weak or most at risk or most vulnerable in your present circumstances. Like if we reopen in such a way that the strong are able to come together and fellowship together and participate in the Eucharist together, but others are left out, would we be committing the same kind of problematic behavior as the Corinthians? And I'm genuinely asking this question. I think this is something that I'm pondering. Because Paul says to us in verse 17, like there is a way of gathering together that is not for the better, that's actually for the worse. So I think Paul's saying to me as, as your shepherd and, and us as a community, like examine yourselves, examine your hearts to make sure you're in the right place. Make sure that you're seeking solidarity with the weaker members of the body, with those that are struggling or limited in ways that you're not. Make sure you're seeking to mirror to one another the self-giving action of Christ, which is precisely what you celebrate when you come together for the Eucharist. 
see brothers and sisters this is this is a weird season we're in <laughs> honestly it's it's like a really weird season we're in but I wonder if in the midst of this season, God has given us like a tremendous opportunity to actually expand our care for one another and our compassion for one another and our attentiveness to one another. And what I don't want us to miss out on as a church is to be so eager for kind of quick fixes to be able to get back together as quickly as possible, although I long for that and I'm trying to find ways for us to do that as safely as possible. But what I long for us in this season is that we would not miss out on what God is trying to teach us in this season, of the ways in which he is seeking to form us as a people, and who he is, wants to make us to be. Because I wonder if in this season, he doesn't want this to be a weakening season for us. He wants this to be a strengthening and a deepening season as a community. So that when we come out of this together, like we're stronger and we're better for it. And we are better able to reflect the goodness of God to the world around us. And I would also suggest that it may be in fasting from the Eucharist during this season. It doesn't mean that we have a low view of the Eucharist. I sure hope not. Maybe it's quite the opposite. Maybe it's because we have a really high view of the unity that the Eucharist invites us to honor and cherish and seek, desiring that no one would be left out. Maybe it's that high view of the Eucharist that actually encourages us to fast in this moment, to see this fast as an act of hospitality towards those in our community that have struggles that, that maybe not all of us have or limits that maybe not all of us have. And I think this is precisely what Paul goes on to say in his second admonition. He says, examine yourselves. And then in verse 33, he says, wait for one another. So then, my brothers and sisters, says Paul, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. It's the language of patience. The Greek word translated wait for can also be translated receive or welcome, meaning it can have the nuance not only of patience, but of hospitality, like receive one another, welcome one another. I think one of the things I've been asking myself in this season is how do we show hospitality? How do we be a welcoming, and a peaceful and a patience presence with one another in an age of pandemic and of racial tensions. How do we do that in such a way that those who are hurting and feel weak and vulnerable don't feel left behind, but feel like the whole community is, is waiting to receive them, longing to welcome them into their presence? See, this time that we're in calls for a deep concern for justice, yes. It calls for a deep longing for healing and wholeness, yes. It calls for us to be a voice of lament and repentance, yes. It calls for us to yearn and work for reconciliation and unity and change in our world, yes. But this situation, and I think with the church, can so deeply offer the world, also calls for patience, waiting for one another, and for hospitality, welcoming one another. Leo Tolstoy once said, patience is waiting, but it's not passive waiting. That's laziness. To keep going when the going is hard and when the going is slow, that is patience. In a book I've been reading on the patient ferment of the early church, a guy named Alan Kreider says this. He says, God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work. And that's why Christians can be patient, because they believe that in Christ all things are possible. And then he says this wonderful line. He says, patience grows out of praising the God who holds all things securely. Brothers and sisters, we wait for one another. We long for one another.
we welcome one another. We receive one another with patience and with hospitality and with affection and with concern for the most vulnerable in our midst. Why? Because we know that God holds us together. What's going to hold the church together in the midst of pandemic and racial tension? God. God holds his people together. God is at work. So brothers and sisters, it's a privilege to be a Eucharistic fellowship with you. I cannot wait to partake of the bread and the wine again with you in unity and in affection. And in the meantime, God is inviting us to live out this Eucharistic fellowship with an others-oriented way of living. And that, that will show the world just how generous God really is. I say these things to you and speak these things to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.